Welcome to our Monday Thursday reflection together. Monday Thursday is usually one of the most interactive services of the year. It's that service in which we participate together in Jesus' final actions on the day before his crucifixion. We participate in his washing of the disciples' feet. We then share communion together because Monday Thursday is the day in which he institutes and ordains that which we call the Lord's Supper. And then we read about his descent into the shadows, his betrayal, his arrest, and his disciples fleeing and abandoning him. Now, two of these three are impossible to share together as we normally do. We can't wash one another's feet. We can't share in communion. And so what I hope to do in our time together is approach these events of Monday Thursday as a broadcaster, describing the events to you and my hope is that these events and their description will allow a deep reflection on your part and my part on the significance and the meaning of the events of Monday Thursday. And so I invite you with me to calm your mind, to recognize that in the upper room you are at a feast with friends, at a very intimate setting, and I invite you to enter the scene with me as we read together about this that occurs on Monday, Thursday. Before we read about Jesus' foot washing, I want to invite you to share with me in these gathering words. Thursday night is not our usual time to meet. Something is up. Why the teacher as a servant? What's this of leaving and remembering? What does this mean? Jesus, help us understand. Well, on that night, we read of Jesus washing the disciples' feet in John chapter 13. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. This is the account we get from John, and one of the things we have to ask ourselves as observers and participants is, why is Jesus washing the disciples' feet? Well, what would you do if you knew that this was the last night that you would have on earth. What would you do? You'd probably gather some close friends. You'd probably share with them what was most meaningful to you and what you would hope that they had gained from knowing you. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He gathers his closest followers who are now his closest friends, and he shares with them what's most meaningful to him with hopes that they've learned something from his life. And he shares not just with words, but as he always has with his life and through his actions. He shows them and doesn't just tell them, as he gives them an example of holy love, as he takes the lowest place and serves his followers and loves them to the end, as John writes, loves them to the utmost. He follows up this action with a command from which we get the name for Monday Thursday, mandatum. That new command is to love one another as I have loved you. There's nothing new in this command, love one another. That's a command found in the book of Leviticus. What's new is love one another as I have loved you. What's new is that Jesus has given us an example, a model. He's demonstrated God's way to live, and he's done it through the power of an example, which is important because most of what we learn, we learn by example. Infants mimic their facial expressions of their parents. Children will imitate their parents by playing house, playing school, playing dress up. We even learn some of the most complex things through mimicking, through modeling. We learn language. 
We learn it as our parents and those around us model it for us. None of us learn the rules of grammar first. Our parents never sat down with us and meticulously taught us. Now, listen, young person, every sentence includes a subject and a verb. Verbs are either active or passive, transitive or linking. Linking verbs require predicate nominatives. Transitive verbs require direct objects. Adverbs modify verbs. Adjectives modify nouns. Now talk. That's not how we learned language. We learn it by hearing it, by seeing it in practice. And we learn faith in the same way. We observe others who practice that faith, and then we imitate their actions. And it's then over the course of time, we seek to master the rules as we grow in understanding. Now we teach faith to others in the same way. We bear witness to our faith and that's exactly what Jesus has done in his washing of the disciples' feet. He says such as he follows up our account by saying, little children, no, verse 12, after he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I've done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus doesn't just tell. He says, I've given you an example. He shows, and he is the standard. He is the bar that they're to live up to. And I know that many of us say, well, that's Jesus. I can't live up to that bar. And you're right. But Jesus still remains the standard. We can't complain about others' disbelief and misbehavior if we won't ourselves seek to live up to the model that we've get, been given to love one another as we've been loved in Christ Jesus. What's interesting about this final night is Jesus knows he's about to die unjustly. He knows what's ahead of him. And it's interesting what he doesn't do. He doesn't rage about life's unfairness. He doesn't tell his disciples to avenge his death. No, he serves them. He serves even his betrayer, for Judas is there as one of the twelve. And then he gives them this final mandate. He says, little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I've said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What's interesting is Jesus says on his final night, this is what my life has been about. If you love me, if you've learned anything from me, do this. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, that's what Jesus does on the final full night of his life with his friends in the intimate setting of an upper room. What would you do if that was your friend? What would you do if you heard these last words and saw this last action from a dying friend? What you would probably do is you'd remember dearly their actions, and you'd seek for the rest of your life to honor their words, to honor what was most precious to them, that you in seeing their life and experiencing their presence and in honoring their legacy would love one another as we've been loved. And with that before us, I invite you to join me in this response. Jesus, you loved us in the beginning and you loved us to the end. Even on the night you were betrayed, you took a towel and washed our feet. We confess that we are reluctant to think of you doing such a humble task, least of all for us. Like Peter, we protest. We fail to see how love takes the lowly way, 
how it is worked out in a thousand small acts of kindness, a thousand humilities. For ourselves, we prefer the grand gestures, love that can be seen and applauded, love that makes us feel good. But you showed a different way, Jesus, towel bearer, foot washer, cross carrier. You have set us an example for our own Good Friday journeys. We long to follow you wherever you lead us. Amen. But Jesus doesn't just leave them with words and an example. He leaves them with a community practice to remember this event, a practice that we share in monthly at Emmanuel United Church of Christ. He leaves them with what we call the Lord's Supper, Communion, Eucharist, the table of our Lord. Why does Jesus establish this new practice for his followers? Well, it's established at the Passover meal, which was a yearly reminder of Israel's great redemptive event. It was a deeply symbolic meal, and you'll know this if you've ever participated in a Seder, that recalled God's deliverance from slavery in Egypt, where God's grace delivered God's people through the blood of the Passover lamb, which led to the Israelites' exodus from Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea. And so now, just as God has redemptively acted in Israel's escape from slavery, God is going to redemptively act in the way that Jesus is about to take as he begins his path toward the cross. For the liberating Lord of the Exodus is going to continue to make a way out of slavery. And in this case, it's a way out of slavery to sin. In this meal, Jesus wants to demonstrate something that the fullness of God's love is being revealed through his actions. That's why he says, this is my body, this is my blood. Though some are reticent to use this language, when Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, he is giving these symbols as a way to know that God has completely given God's self to us in the sacrifice of Christ Jesus that Jesus is going to hold nothing back but to give everything, body, blood, flesh, sweat, life. And that we, when we join together in this supper, when we eat of this meal, we know that we are joined to that self-giving of God, that we are willingly receiving this divine gift. Now, I know, because I've done this for 27 years, some will reject communion at times they'll say, you know, I've sinned very grievously this week, or they'll say, I'm just simply not worthy of this meal. But may I remind you, that's the point. There's only one that's faithful, and that is Jesus. All will fall away. As he eats this meal in the intimacy of the upper room, he is eating it with 12 disciples. Judas is eating with him, and Judas will betray him. All of them will deny him. All of them will flee in the face of trouble, which is why this is a feast not for those who are worthy or sinless, but it is a feast for sinners because it is a feast of forgiveness. We turn our backs, we prove unfaithful, yet God will not forget nor neglect nor reject God's covenant faithfulness to us. At Emmanuel United Church of Christ, we have what we call Feast with Friends. This is Jesus' Feast with Forsakers. Jesus is at the table surrounded by a betrayer and 11 deniers. He knows, he expects this betrayal, he expects their denial, and yet he clearly says, this is my body, this is my blood, I'm doing this for you, for the forgiveness of sin. At communion, we find ourselves seated at a table, confessing our own denials and our own acts of betrayal. And we confess those things that we might fully welcome Jesus' gospel, as we recognize that our best intentions cannot save, that it is only through the faithfulness of God demonstrated in Jesus' life and death and resurrection that salvation can be found for us and for the world. And so we see Jesus here give everything, body, blood, sweat, tears, life. 
giving his own life for us and for the world. Because it's not our faithfulness, I'm sorry, it's not our faithlessness that will have the final word. Instead, it is God's forgiveness, the resurrecting power of God, a word of pure gospel. This is my love given wholly and completely for you. Now, this journey will not be easy, and that's why we move from the foot washing to communion on Monday, Thursday, to what we call the service of shadows. We see Jesus remaining faithful in the midst of the greatest challenges that one can possibly face, the challenges of betrayal, the challenges of suffering and of loneliness and abandonment. And with that said, we enter into this service of shadows as Jesus begins his descent into darkness. The Shadow of Betrayal, Matthew 26, 20 through 25. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him, one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus replied, You have said so. We come to the shadow of betrayal. Jesus' descent into the darkness begins with the most painful dagger, a betrayal by a friend, a betrayal from a trusted companion, his beloved disciple. And in this betrayal, he experiences what I call the wound of love. For as Michael Card writes, only a friend can betray a friend. Betrayal is always personal. It's never expected. That's the thing about betrayal. We never see it coming. And the reason we never see it coming is it comes from someone we trust. It comes from those we love the most, those who are closest to us, those who are our intimate friends or relatives or parents or children or spouses. It comes from a source we never expected, and that's what makes betrayal so difficult. We find ourselves betrayed precisely because we never thought we would be. And that's why when I think of betrayal, I see it as the wound of love. The scar of betrayal is the high cost of loving. There's only one way to prevent betrayal, and that's to close one's heart to everyone. But that's no solution. The sol solution is not to run from love. We are commanded by Jesus to love as we've been loved. The solution is to risk loving in spite of the devastating possibilities. And here Jesus, in bearing our sin, willingly bears the wound of love the betrayal of a friend, which is the price of love and of loving. It is the first painful dagger he bears in carrying our sins and taking them to the cross. That then leads to the shadow of inner agony. Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. We come to the shadow of inner agony, and we see an extraordinary expression of emotional vulnerability. Jesus takes the three disciples who'd seen him in his glory, they'd seen his transfiguration, and now they see his inner anguish as he willingly admits the depths of sorrow. He says, I'm deeply grieved to the point of death which is a way of saying my sadness is so intense, it feels like it may kill me. At no other point is Jesus ever more visibly anguished and distressed. 
And what's interesting here is Jesus, our Savior, does not face death with a stoic calm. He experiences himself a sudden assault of fear and trembling bordering on terror, and his disciples must have been shocked by this sudden vulnerability. Like a young child who sees his or her parent break down in tears for the first time, Jesus had always been the strong one. He'd always been the calm one. He'd always been the one in control. There's a philosophy of family systems theory, which I follow, which says that the most important function to being a leader is to remain a non-anxious presence. For if the leader panics, everyone is going to panic. A calm leader will de-stress a community. But here Jesus is not holding on to calmness. He is not a non-anxious presence. His followers are seeing the one who's normally in control absolutely lose control, and this must have been destabilizing to them. You would think that they would have done more than they did because Jesus has only one desire for them. He wants his closest companions to stay with him during this time of need. He asks them, please pray with me, keep watch with me, stay awake with me just for one hour, because he longs for human comfort like we all would as he faces his greatest fear. He needs the strength of another's presence, because as the Beatles sang, we all get by with a little help from our friends. But yet they fall asleep. And in his anguished prayer, he throws himself on the ground, falling on his face, and he prays, oh God, if there's another way, do I have to die? Does it have to end like this? And yet, not my will, but thine be done, which is his way of expressing his trust in God in the midst of his greatest trial. And it's a way of showing us that peace is not always a sign of being in the middle of God's will. Sometimes we just simply have to accept the hard road before us, and that is what Jesus is doing. He is bearing our suffering, bearing our grief, bearing our sorrows, entering into our vulnerability in order to bear the weight of our sin as he moves forward another step on this journey to the cross, which leads him then to the shadow of loneliness. Then Jesus came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial, for the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. We come here to the shadow of loneliness. In the midst of his struggles, Jesus returns to his disciples again and again, and he finds that they have abandoned him. They are sleeping. The final question to his disciples in the midst of this desperate situation is, couldn't you just simply stay awake with me for one hour? How it must have hurt to be let down by his closest companions and friends at this most difficult hour. We know he expected, expected nothing from his worst enemies, but did his closest friends really love him so little? Why did they sleep? Were they bored? Were they tired? Or were they just weak? They had promised to be with him until the end. They had said, you know, others may fail and fall, but not us. But like us, their intentions were greater than their execution. There was a limit to their faithfulness, as there's a limit to our faithfulness. As Jesus bears this loneliness in isolation. And yet he resolves to suffer alone. He won't allow the disciples' unfaithfulness, nor our unfaithfulness, to impact his faithfulness as he moves then into the shadow of desertion. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. 
With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priest and elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. We come to the final place of shadow and suffering, this shadow of desertion. And we discover Jesus is fully and finally completely alone. He's in the custody of his enemies. Everyone has abandoned him. All those who were close to him have proved unfaithful. And now he marches toward his inevitable end, toward false charges and mockery and beating and whipping and then a death on a cruel Roman cross. And yet at no point will he rage against his enemies. At no point will he answer violence with violence because he is going to fully show what he meant when he gave that mandate to love one another, even in his loving his enemies. He said earlier this evening, I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. 